Okay, so I'm gonna show this for, it's very short. I'm gonna show this to set the tone. Um, there you go. So this is sort of a, a wink to the conversation we had yesterday with Julian about the extraordinariness of matter. And it's in Bolivia. So this is in um, the salt desert uh, or salt lake, I guess, it, in Bolivia, um, Ushini, and it's also the um, happens to be uh, one of the biggest sources of lithium in the world. I think it's like 50% of the world's lithium is right there, and then you know maybe like 45% of the rest is like in another salt desert in Chile, not so far, um, and you know clearly it's being drilled. Um, and hopefully if I have enough time to go through all the talk, then we can go back, come full circle to this idea of, uh, matter, <coughs> material, planet, and solar system, geology, all that stuff. So, but, um, I'm going to show this now, which is a, um, we go full screen, uh, This is a publication project. Um, so how's the resolution? So this is just to give you an idea of how it was laid out. And then, you know, after this sh other slide, then we'll go into just full on pictures. But just to give you an idea of the, so it's, it's a book that um, was published maybe like two years ago with five other artists. And it's a timeline. Yeah, we can't see anything. Maybe zoom in. So it's a, it's like a, it's a three level pro um, pro um, kind of printed printed project. So one level is a timeline that sort of takes over a lot of the things that was mentioned yesterday. So it starts actually with, um, it starts in 1546 with the, with the sort of um, mining of uh, silver in Bolivia. Um, and so this is in a mountain that's 4,824 meters high um, in, 1546, mining silver um, up until 1800. So this is sort of histories of ascent, histories of garden. It's very subjective, obviously. Um, histories of uh, mapping um, and sort of apprehending landscape and peaks and sort of the desire of um, creating a rationale for uh, landscape. So you know the dates. I can sh I can read a few of them, but basically there were, there's a lot of the stuff that was mentioned yesterday, like 1782 observations relative to picturesque beauty, 1786 first ascent of the Mont Blanc, that's 4,800 meters, um, and and so on until like Walden 1854, Alpine Club 1857. Um, and then this is laid together with photographs of, so there's um, <coughs> two groups of photographs. Some of the photographs are the ones that I took. And then some other photographs are from family archives because I happened to have a great uncle that worked in a company that were building uh, bridges and tunnels. <coughs> so basically it's about creating accessibility to, you know, and connections in in areas that you know would have been um, uh, more difficult to pass, and also bypassing the mountain, um, and and the third level of this is um, so let's go to the second page. So then, 
you see, so th there's two pages of timeline and the rest is, is photographs like more full full um, full page and the text is is um, I worked with a friend who's um, a fiction writer and also a mountain climber and so there's sort of kind of technical text about um, mountaineering and um, also the sort of history of mountaineering and early mountaineering and how it kind of collided with histories of conquest and sort of so there's like um, the techniques of mountaineering the equipment development sort of there's a moment where it fits with um, uh, desire to create a rationale uh, for mapping and then also it converges with the historical context of you know sort of India World War two or like preparing World War one two and all, all of that um, colonial kind of um, context um, sort of creates funding and 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 um, uh, gathers groups to actually go there on expeditions. So I'm just gonna read you a few of these things and run the slideshow. Um, this is in Aosta, actually, not too far. So, mountain climbing evolves according to improvements in lightweight technologies, which allow parties to climb faster for longer. So rather than climbing getting easier, people today are climbing more difficult lines on established mountains and ways, and at a speed which would have been, seemed impossible to whimper, mummery, mallory, and all. Um, technology can be a terrible trap for those it leaves behind. The early climbers on Everest, for example, in the 1920s, got astonishingly high wearing tweeds and nailed boots. Their fitness, willpower, and capacity for suffering can now seem otherworldly. This is not running. I'm just gonna try to do this, sorry. Um, the early 1950s marked a watershed in Himalayan climbing. It was at this time that technical um, advance, technological advance and political complaisance combined to make the ascent of all great peaks not just possible, but for a well-equipped team straightforward enough. Funding has changed the nature of access to the mountains, depending on which way you look at it. You might describe the shift as being more crudely capitalist or more openly democratic. It used to be that in order to have access to mountaineering, you had to be brought up in the hills or born with an aristocracy of time and experience. Um, and, and I was really into um, intertext, so everything is in footnotes. But I'm just going to read you this also because it's very cute about um, the example of the Austrian Hermann Bull will serve to illustrate the first group here. Bull's story, as told in his wonderful memoir, Nanga Parbat Pilgrimage, is the single most joyous account of a mountaineering apprenticeship. Bull grows up humbling in the view of the mountains and is drawn inexorably towards them. His story is a romantic one of long days in the sun and increasingly bold adventures. The narrative has the easy swing of a boy in a on a bicycle, of dry bread lunches and glorious friendships and being grateful for that. As with any mountaineering story, there's always death and risk. And Bull appears to be immune to these mortalities from the start. His own trajectory is our straight and has the quality of myth soaring towards his own senseless death on Trogoliza in 1957. Um, so I'm going to read you a few of these dates. 1881, Nietzsche, First Summer in Sils Maria. 1890, The Treasure of the Yosemite and Features of the Proposed National Park, John Muir. Um, 1904, British Indian Invasion of Tibet. 1911, Machu Picchu, discovered um, 2,430 meters, artifacts sent to Yale University. 1921, first recognition um, expedition to Everest, 8,840 um, 8, meters. Um, 1924, the Magic Mountain. Qu'est-ce qui se passe? C'est le. Ça se met en Did the slideshow go through? I think so. Okay. So, yeah, 1965, inauguration of the Mont Blanc Tunnel. 1968, Tragedy of the Commons, 1969, Asphalt Rundown, Robert Smithings. So, um, yeah, so that's one project. Um, which I guess is a more sort of um, uh, uh, 
it's 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 about landscape like landscape as this place of projection and and and, and sort of more uh, um, more about desire and loss I feel like because you project this idea and fantasy on landscape and then it's really about the the sort of um, dilemma where you sort of have to destroy the very thing that you desire but because you desire it for purity and then by the very and, and sort of that that was the idea behind sort of putting all those tunnel photos is um and and sort of fits the romantic idea of the mountain and it fits the uh, the figure the melancholic figure of sort of you love you desire this thing but then you you instead of loving it and sort of you know living with it and maybe not loving it anymore or losing it you would rather like eat it or have like absorb it then then and and yeah and this is sort of like the Machu Picchu syndrome how do I get out of this uh, try escape <laughs> um so that, that that's a more like landscape as projection and um and so I want to show something a little bit more proactive um and and also yeah and the the idea of um rural politics and um agriculture and sort of the the uh, uh what's at stake in the young farmers movement of sort of reclaiming the commons and you know having like sort of a sustainable future and and feeling good about like all the sort of stratas of your economy and and how you interact with the world uh, you know that's that's not landscape as as projection that's like rurology and 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 landscape as like um, terrain, like action. So this is, um, well, no, full screen. Slide trip. So hopefully this goes very fast. There's a film still. Can I do a slideshow? I think it is running. No, because I, I was just. Pre I'm sorry, huh? Everybody's getting like. This one. Okay, so art and agriculture is this foundation that I started with two other people um, that uh, own this uh, piece of land. It's a 160 acre, um, mostly forested land upstate New York in the Catskills. And so this is an area that it seems all of you are very familiar with because it is the home of Frederick Church, Thomas Cole, and uh, the Hudson River School of Painting. Um, so it has a historical precedent for sort of creating consciousness um, for, yeah, uh, preservation and, 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 and also the importance of landscape and beauty and aesthetics in the uh, natural environment um, in relationship to the arts. This is ginseng, um, lots of agroforestry. Um, so that's that's the geographic context. I um, so I started this foundation with uh, with uh, Peter Naden and Anne Kennedy. They own this land. Um, they've owned this land for like twenty years, and um, and sort of, and we sort of set up. Um, a farm that's also like a exchange platform for people um, like mostly from the art world to um, you know kind of discover the farm thing and then and 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 this is a mutual relationship um, with the sort of local social landscape and so art and agriculture is an alliance between sort of at the convergence between agriculture art and ecology and um, so it's a functional it's a functional farm and it's a diversified production which means that you know the ecology of the farm is is given priority to um sort of a cash crop or something and um the the idea has never been to um to uh call agriculture art or the opposite um but um it's an idea that's uh, or the mission or the ambition for for Art in agriculture was to sort of observe that um, it's like a, it's a process-oriented approach. It's it was a way to observe um, that the gestures that um, uh, connect us to the land um, and the the agrarian gestures of planting um, 
sewing, touching, and, and eating, all of those things, um, our, uh, our sense of touch in relationship to material, in re relationship to matter, and in relationship to the world, and, um, and those gestures are things that we find in the art practice as well. And so, uh, seeing that, um, what's going on? Eggs, diversified flock, ducks, chickens, um, little sea bright birds, teas, wild teas. I mean, not, those are not wild, those are planted flowers. CSA, new formats of exchange, like not, we sold at the market, but we also, like I had a CSA at, at BARD, at CCS BARD, which is like a master's, a master's arts program in the summer, and a lot of my friends from New York City were there, and they, you know, were carpooling to go to Price Chopper, so then, you know, I created the CSA there, and, um, you know, we would also go to the city and sell things, this is a greenhouse, um, so it's also about produce, it's, it's propagation, like starting our own. It's about, you know, seed resilience and uh, adapted to the landscape. And this is also an area that's um, knowing like a tremendous amount of revival. And so we talked about like seed libraries yesterday. They, there is a Hudson River or Hudson Valley seed library. They were actually librarians before. So should I plug this in somehow? Because this it's like, really going to be a problem. C'est la veille, le problème. Mm -hmm. Non, non, c'est pas. C'est bizarre, si je mets ça, là, ça va marcher, non? Ouais. So, anyways, so this is art and agriculture. Um, this is where I was sleeping in the summer. That's what I'm eating. Um, it's all really great. Uh, we're going to go sort of fast because it's, um, time's, time's going sort of, uh, and really beautiful light, but I'm just gonna go a little bit further to products, you know, and it's about like packing, uh, what is it called? Uh, Trail of Tears beans. Um, and, and, and art in the greenhouse, ceramics. This is how I started ceramics. It's, it was about creating the vessel for the food we were growing um, out of the same dirt. So this is a little bit, you know, what we were talking about yesterday with Suzanne. Um, and, uh, people, people, eating, conviviality. I think this is something that we haven't talked about so much, like even Illich and um, our relationship and our tools to how we apprehend socially the landscape. And kimchi, kimchi, hello. Uh, live ferment, lots of, lo like, tremendous amount of food at a certain point. And um, so it's like, Farming happens like this in like huge cycles of like uh, how do we call it um, uh, abundance, and then and then and then so uh, you have to figure out how to keep that through the out the year. We tried to start our own currency, um, but um, ceramic studio and so and then I just want to show the so uh, why, um, uh, primitive firings and um, uh, what is this called like uh, having your own um, um, having your own system, you know, like you you have to like have your. It's like the plants, your animals. They need to know about the land, and the more you, they grow, generations after generations on that land, the more they will be adapted to those like hard winters, um, and so on. The diversified flock, um, and that's our truck, and that's our label and also like butchering this we talked about this and so we had to get our animals processed at the um okay. slaughterhouse um for legal issues um but we sort of kind of like uh you know worked our way around to at least do our um processing on our own so the, the these are like you know young cool butchers from new york city and um and um, uh, and this is this is hugely important, and it doesn't seem like it to, but we, we talked about this, like making your own pate, making your own bacon um, over like a very small quantity is is like the most radical thing you can be doing in this uh, food industry, um, and so uh, making this is like totally illegal hams, um, and so that's our farm stand. 
the raw milk revolution. So ceramic had you know same uh, ceramics made out of the same soil and the meat and the politics, all of it is you know at the at the farm stand. So that's art and agriculture. It's this functioning organization and. Um, and I, I worked there for four or five years to kind of uh, sort of do the first layer of work and 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 then and then you know it started working so we hired people and and now it's now it's it's functional so so that's um, sort of what I did for a little bit of time and how did I have it all together so and then yeah there's lots of it, I feel like it's a movement, you know. There's there's really a lot of people uh, doing this now. Um, should I show you a little movie of the of the farm? Mm -hmm. Most things are visible all the time. Others come and go like the nose man who lives in the compost. I feed him when I see him, but most often he doesn't appear. But I sense him even when I don't see him. We know what's in the room, but what's in the ground under the building and what's coming up. And chickens, they go to eat, but they also know stuff. And then you look around and think, well, what part of this is conscious? Is it just me and the dog? Me and you? But what if the whole thing is conscious? And then we give it representation. The mark is the proof of the pudding. The mark is the proof of the pudding in the eating of the bird in the brush of the hand. It's a Malevich play, Victory Over the Sun, adapted for Broadway. Let's get the numbers up. A group of figures enter slowly to the left with somber airs and the gravity of movement. The figures are recognized as Rita Kahlo, John Paul, George, and Ringo, and Falstaff, who moves like he got something in his pants, muttering, Falstaff to my friends, Falstaff to my friends, Sir John to the rest of Europe, Sir John to the rest of Europe, Falstaff to my friends, Falstaff to my friends, Said John to the rest of Europe. Said John to the rest of Europe. Yo ho, yo ho, yo ho. I am who I am. Yam, 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 yam. Okay. So that's that's art and agriculture, old field farm, Catskills, and um, this is where I am now. Um, uh, so this is also like uh, what we talked about yesterday. So it's good. We were all in the sort of same subject. Um, this is the quarry. Um, same thing. They dig sand, metal, um, throw the clay in the river. Um, so, and I think there's, well, that's like an install that I did for Heritage Days. That's tomorrow. And, um... But uh, okay, so that's what the native clay looks like. Lots of lots of uh, steel in it. The red. So the white is regular clay, but it's you know, um, that's that. So that's what the clay looks like. And and I think I have a little video of us going to dig it around. Uh, so and. Ça, après ça peut être décevant, ça peut sortir. Moi j'en ai plus, je trouve que ça sortait blanc de ça. Ah. 
Je veux dire, ça va faire des trucs de fou et en fait, ça sort belge, quoi. Tout sort belge. Mais c'est pas dit que ça sorte... Tu sais, une fois, j'ai été hyper déçu avec le violet. Mais là, là c'est plutôt... Euh, euh, c'est plutôt cuivre, quoi. La couleur, c'est pas vrai. C'est plutôt jaune. C'est vrai que c'est plutôt jaune que le violet. Mais j'ai été hyper déçu par le violet. Voilà. Mmh. Um, a... euh, vraiment de l'activité humaine et lui il a trouvé un bout de céramique qui m'a filé un petit bout de céramique cuite du néolithique mmh. c'est si je peux <coughs> parce que c'est vraiment un spot et ils le détruisent ils le détruisent sans fond ni loin parce que euh, si tu vois s'ils commencent à ouais, dire ouais, que, ouais, ouais, euh, sinon après ils ont pris des, des, des archéologues sinon ils ont interdit des... d'exploiter ouais. et alors on trouve aussi des, des espèces de boue euh, rouge comme ça là et ça, et ça, des fois, tu vois, là, plus loin, là, on risque de le trouver euh, qui se délite. Ouais. Et ça, moi, je m'en sers, je mets, je mets ça dans de l'eau, et après, euh, tu vois, mais là, il est hyper bien celui-là. Et ça fait un rouge, un, un rouge vraiment, à haute température, ça sort rouge. Je fais des engobes rouges comme ça, là. Ouais, voilà. Alors, et du coup, tu, des fois, tu vois, on... voilà, ça, voilà. Ça, tu le réduis en poudre, et ça, c'est du fer, ouais. Ça, ça, ça fait des super enveloppes, j'en ai pas besoin de beaucoup. Oui, oui, oui c'est ça, oui. C'est sûr, il peut être fait comme ça aussi, des fers rouges, en, même en, même en faillant. Il, il a du bien, là. C'est plus rapide, ça. Alors, bah, tu vas voir là-bas, il y a plus de blanc, il y a plus de blanc. Il y a plus de blanc, il y a plus de blanc. Il y a plus de blanc, il y a plus de blanc. Oui, il y a plus de blanc, il y a plus de blanc. So, we're going to keep on playing this. I realize maybe some of you don't understand. But um, uh, it's just sort of the visual thing to um, get. Um, and then I'm going to, I, I want to close our conversation. Oh, wow. No, I want to. Well, I'm going to do this. And then I'm just going to show one little thing to throw some water in the fire for our later conversation. Um, but um, so that's, that's, that's like how the, the, you know, we dry the clay and then we have to like smash it and so on. But um, so we'll just play this it's just you know visual background but i want to talk about this ezra orion people know about him sculpture in the solar system and so the the sub chapters are called from tectonic sculpture to intergalactic sculpture this is like from the 70s and he um was proposing his proposal was to uh, make sculptures in on mars uh, And, and, and I mean, he seems to be a pretty serious guy. Like there's letters from David, Na um, yeah, like Ben Gurion, you know, like the Israeli prime minister, but also like, you know, David Nash and maybe like, there's some pictures of Michael Heiser in there. Um, and it's really great because there's like beautiful client, like sort of Himalayan climbers, like really tan sort of shepherd, like high, high peak shepherds. Um, and then there's, Photos of, I'm gonna pass this around because it's so fantastic. And then, there, you know, it's like sort of classic land art feature <coughs> stuff. And, um, and so, and it's nice because it's about like what the sort of what I want to talk about and at the beginning with this sort of goofy, goofy video that I showed at the very beginning. But it's about how, you know, the experience of the <laughs> desert and all of that sort of American Southwest beauty is, you know, I mean, I experienced it when I was like maybe 22 and it, it profoundly changed my relationship to the world, my relationship to sculpture, my relationship to materials. And, um, and in some ways, um, you know, it, uh, it didn't make sense to me before. And the idea of like forces and, you know, the planet and different surfaces and so on. And, and when you go to the desert, that, that becomes sort of clear. And then as a sculptor, you, um, Yeah, it's a, it's a really humbling experience and it's also extraordinary because you understand like how, where your practice fits in, in like a, a really much longer lineage than, than art history. Um, yeah, classic, cl classic land art, like hill, make a hole in the hill. Um, and you know, and us going to dig native clay, I don't think is sort of so far away so far removed from this. Um, so, um, and,
Sculpture is a generator. <coughs> it embodies a meaning dispatching a fan of conscious processes, a long distance from space and time and beyond the physical generator. The process is that of an individual who creates a generator which comes into contact with a sensitive receptor within whom a reservoir sensitive to the slightest pressures on the trigger <coughs> waits intense anticipation. Um, Sculpture is shaping masses by forces in space, time, extending beyond the human realm. Plate tectonics is sculpture, which is the drift of the continents, the colliding and uplifting of mountainous ridges, and the folding of the Earth's crust. The strongest tectonic pulses occurs over the past 40 million years, starting towards the end of the Eocene, lifting the ranges of the Rockies, the Andes, the Atlas Mountains, the Alps, the Taurus Range, and the Himalayas. Um... Scaling yourself against rockiness is an existential experience. Time, space, geoslowness, <coughs> the silence of light years, a universality of communities of cosmic particles moving in the void of the infinite. All this is touching tragicomic particles happening. Um, so yeah, he's like the Nijinsky of like sculpture. Um, so a lot of this is, you know, sort of enlightened, but, but I think it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. I, that's sort of what I want to talk about with sculpture and land art and, and, and stuff like that. So I'm just going to pass this around and, um, and then, um, yeah. Do I have like two minutes, three minutes? Yeah. yeah. Um, just as a conclusion, I mean, different, sort of different, different conclusion, go back to, I think in my, in my thing, I wanted to talk about this after art and agriculture, but I, I sort of got distracted and got, um, so this is at the train station before I came here, Avignon, people mowing the lawn, um, gear, lots of gear, um, and um yeah lots of energy being spent uh not not a fun job not so well paid probably either um and so that the ur urban public space also you know and and so and and then now i'm working with these people that can we do like a full screen on this I just really want to see this No. Ah. Okay. This is very pleasing to me visually. So there, this to me is like a certain avant-garde of like uh, agrarian agricultural practice, like environmental activism, everything. To me, it's like it's a it's sort of a you know really interesting practice. And so there, they are shepherds based in Saint-Denis, they have a sponsorship from like Stade de France um, and, and what they do is go around um, <coughs> go around different places where there is a, a nutritious potential and they sort of propose a sort um, uh, it's like a differentiated management of urban green spaces and this really is a model that functions very well in the periphery like sent like of course like especially places like paris is like the center is it's another problem and even you know paris parks they only have sand so it's it's not very adapted but when you we look at urban sprawl and the sort of like building strategies that are going on and then the sort of you know uh uh how do you say friche in 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 english like uh Waste. Like wasteland, like in between urban, uh, sort of urban sprawl. This is really like a way also to like make people walk again, you know, like when, uh, um, because those landscapes are, are sort of created um, for driving, like uh, over the American model. And so, you know, they, these, these people, like they, what they do is move their sheep around Saint-Denis and like uh, Plain Saint-Denis, Aubervilliers. And, and go where, you know, and they are sometimes hired by the city, sometimes they're hired by like private entities that have roof, roof, green roofs or something. And, you know, here and there, but they also, it's like, it works on many different levels. Of course, like it's better than um, spending more, more fuel to, to cut grass, which could be a nutritious thing. Um, 
and and um, and for the ecological cycle. But that's like the basis. But also socially, it's really important. And then uh, time-wise, so like you bring in like a different scale. You bring in a different time time scope. You bring in a different rhythm, and then you're walking. And and so socially, it's like a, it's a huge plus. And um, and and it's an educational opportunity. I mean, there's many different levels at which it can function, but it's also just could be integrated in the existing system. It's very flexible. And and then there's also like, it's it's about integrating all the crafts that go after this, like making sweaters, um, eating the meat and so on. So this is, yeah, I'm working with these people now. We're gonna do a performance in October at uh, the Botanical Gardens. So hopefully it will, it will, it will resonate. Thank you. <laughs>